Well, I am thrilled to be in discussion this morning with Santiago and Ndidi. Um, we humbly will be offering some thoughts on the global state of impact investing. Uh, we each represent a different geography, the United States, Latin America, and Africa. And our colleague, uh, Doreen, in a minute, will talk a bit from the Asia perspective. So we hope to give you a quick uh, tour around the globe and the state of play. Um, thank you to SOCAP and the Sorensen Impact Institute for hosting us. Really excited for the next three days. Um, I come to this work as an impact investor, an impact entrepreneur, and a field builder. And uh, I think we all, what's centered in all of our work is a commitment to equity, like a lifelong commitment to equity. Um, economic equity, gender equity, racial equity, and many other types of equity. And I think that you will see this as our root, collective root, and we hope that you, uh, that will animate your journey at SOCAP. So just a little bit about the state of play in the United States. Um, we have had some amazing tailwinds, uh, I would say, over the last 10 years, but certainly over the last handful of years, uh, we have moved from a relatively niche practice to more squarely in the mainstream. Um, the GIN, which does a biennial study, uh, suggests that there's over a trillion dollars globally in impact investing. If you add uh, public markets in, it's you know, many trillions of dollars. Um, and in the United States in particular, we have some um, tailwinds in the form of a trio of three enormous government bills, um, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, uh, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act, which is poised to flow hundreds of billions, and then if you partner it with private sector investment, trillions of dollars over the next handful of years. And one of the things we are working on at the US Impact Investing Alliance and the Tipping Point Fund on Impact Investing in coalition with many of you is making sure that communities, particularly historically underserved communities, have a say in how that money flows. That is how we are going to move the dial on economic equity and other types of equity. Just a moment on tailwinds, and then I'll pass it over to Santiago to speak about Latin America. Um, I think it is a testament to the success we have had as a field that our work is drawing um, attacks, political attacks, um, on the pairing of financial considerations and impact considerations from impact investing to ESG. Um, the work that we do and the right to do our work is under attack um, at the state level, at the federal level, in the public square. You couple that with the striking down of affirmative action at the Supreme Court means that DEI practices in all sectors, including of course, not limited to the private sector, is under attack. So we as a field uh, need to come together uh, to defend our right to invest in the ways that we feel will be most impactful. So Santiago, I'd love to pass it to you to share a little bit about the state of play in Latin America. Thank you, Fran. And uh, th that is such an interesting question. Um, as mentioned, I've been in the field of impact investing for over 10 years, specifically focused on Latin America, um, supporting different organizations at different stages of, of that journey uh, from uh, Mexico down to Colombia nowadays. And initially, it was very difficult sort of to find local organizations operating across Latin America in the field of impact investing, social entrepreneurship, um, you name it. It was mostly a field where international players, mostly coming from the north, um, started sort of to uh, open operations in the region to um, get sort of this, this, this movement. Having said that, over the last five to seven years, the ecosystem has really exploded. We've seen flourishing of organizations um, in, in, in terms of um, uh, actors uh, across, the, across the ecosystem, accelerators, entrepreneurs, fund managers, foundations, even the government sort of starting to enter into the field and trying to understand what can be done to really catalyze impact across the spectrum. 
Initially, Latin America, just to, just to share an, an anecdote, um, over the last eight years, I've been building um, Alive Ventures, which is an impact fund manager focused on the Indian region, um, trying to address inequality um, across Latin America, which unfortunately is where the inequality is the greatest uh, globally. And initially, the conversation with, with local players was very binary. It was really, you know, about business as usual or f traditional philanthropy. What we're, there was nothing in between, nothing in the spectrum. Um, when we started Alive Ventures, uh, started fund fundraising, the discussion was either profit or, ph or philanthropy. Nowadays, we're raising our second fund, and the co conversation is entirely different. The conversation is not about pipeline. That was usually also the first question we would be asked in terms of would you be able to find organizations that truly blend impact with um, profit? Now that, that is not the, that's no longer the question. Now the question is really about scale. It's about how we can transcend. It's about how we can make this the mainstream. So there is hope when the, when the region is looked at from the outside Clearly, there are challenges, but also there are opportunities. And the call to action, I think, to all of us that are gathered here today is really how we can achieve scale. Thank you, Santiago. And Didi joins us from Lagos, which means, I don't know what time it is for you, but it is not the bright and shiny morning. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. Could you share a little bit about the state of play of impact investing and impact entrepreneurship in Africa? Thank you so much. It's really an honor and privilege to be here. And building on uh, Santiago's comment, the first thing I'd say about the African continent is that we have 54 very diverse countries. So there's not one state of play. Um, and the complexity and the diversity across those countries really varies. But we have seen also an explosion in not only local giving, where we're starting to see African investors saying, Africa's future belongs to us, and we will invest in social innovators. Through the Africa Philanthropy Forum, through Wealth for Impact, and a range of other initiatives, we're pushing for bridging the gap and connecting social innovators to local investors. And we're seeing angel networks popping up all over the place. We're starting to see pension funds investing in impact funds. And in countries like Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria, we're seeing a lot of growth. However, we're also seeing three Cs that are creating, and over the last two years, some turmoil. Climate, obviously, economic crisis, and then some level of emerging conflicts. And what that does, oftentimes, is especially for international investors that are coming in to partner with local investors, we're seeing a shift to their comfort zone um, and a shrinking of space for local organizations. And that's very worrisome, um, especially because of how important it is to partner in a time when you have climate affecting all of us and a continent like the African continent most affected by climate change, with seven out of 10 countries on the continent most affected. We also see how local entrepreneurs innovating who need the support. Mm -hmm. So my call to action is really around localization and how as impact investors, many of you sitting in this room, we can prioritize investing in local organizations that are closer to the ground, that stay through the good and bad times, that can deliver impact at scale at a fraction of the cost. And as we invest, we must prioritize and track how much funding is actually going to those local organizations. I'm excited about what I've seen in many of our contexts. I work in food and agriculture. I've seen how we are leapfrogging, leveraging innovation, technology, and data. But we see that happening in health, in education, in tech. And I think this is a time to strengthen local organizations for scaling. Thank you. Mm. So th So you bring up the topic of scaling and would love for each of us to speak a little bit about what it will take to get to scale with the understanding that uh, sometimes it's complicated when you're thinking about impact entrepreneurship, you're thinking about local impacts, that um, sometimes you can grow through scale and sometimes you grow through replication. And indeed, sometimes the most innovative practices like participatory investing are small by design, hyper-local by design, and are, are not meant to, to scale. So Santiago, 
Oh, I, I like the spontaneous clapping. <laughs> oh, very energizing. Um, Santiago, can you talk about how to get to scale impact in Latin America? I think that's the, the million dollar question, as they say. Um, and I, and I, I don't think I have the answer, but I, but I do have uh, some, some thoughts, and, and I couldn't agree more with indeed in terms that I think one of the main th things sort of to really reach scale is that we need to continue bringing local players into the space. There is, there has been players coming in over the last years, as I mentioned, but we need to bring more. And we need to bring the mainstream players as well. Therefore, not the foundations, you know, the typical or the usual suspects that we sometimes uh, um, joke around, sort of that we see each other in meeting after meeting, in conference after mo uh, conference. We actually need to bring to the equation and to the discussion more mainstream players. In our case, for example, there has been a, a, a heated debate in terms of how we can bring local capital, institutional local capital, pension funds, insurance companies to really be able to fund the change and the opportunities sort of that the region has to offer. Um, so that, that's, that's really front and center. The other thing that I would highlight is that, I mean, clearly the last 18 months uh, have been tough globally, but in emerging markets and in Latin America particularly, um, the, the, the impact has felt uh, that is, is, um, is exponential. Uh, the volatility of our economies, you know, just uh, when, when there, is, uh, there is global crisis, it just accentuates. Um, but I think within the impact ecosystem, um, we need to see sort of this crisis as a silver lining, as an opportunity. Because when we, when we see what we're trying to change, sort of when we see what the entrepreneurs are trying to address, with, which means, you know, market gaps, are trying sort of to come up with products and services that they can offer to populations that have been traditionally underserved. That means that they're trying sort of to create markets, that they're trying sort of to reach to segments of the economy that traditionally have not been served. And that usually is, means opportunity. Therefore, what we're seeing is that this segment of the economy is actually much more resilient as well to crisis. And we need to make that an opportunity mm. um, to show that, th that there is potential and therefore bring the capital, the local capital for the international capital also then to follow suit to really scale opportunities. Mm. Thank you. One uh, thing that is, drives us at the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance and the Tipping Point uh, Fund on Impact Investing is scaling but doing so with impact integrity. Uh, we believe that all investing has an impact, but it has either been largely or wholly opaque to, to stakeholders. And uh, one thing that we're very excited about is that there is a global regulatory movement afoot to make impact more transparent. In the United States, through the SEC, uh, hopefully we're kind of limping to the finish line on climate disclosure, and we hope that human capital management follows uh, soon after. Um, Governor Newsom in California recently signed uh, into law uh, corporate, corporate disclosure, so if you're doing business, if you're a public or private business in California or doing business with California, which is many, many businesses, you will need to disclose in order to be able to uh, have those companies disclose on scope three emissions. Um, and then as many of you will know, in the UK and Japan, um, in the EU, there are also, these are open regulatory windows simultaneously open. This is, impact transparency is something our field has been working on for decades, and it is a, a, a huge moment, whether it's at the IFRS Foundation with the International Sustainability Standards Board or the concept of double materiality in the EU. One of the things that we are keeping an eye on is the unintended consequences of some of this global disclosure. Uh, for example, we're starting to hear stories uh, from, as a result of the um, CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive from the EU, um, that they're, by law, very soon, that there's a phase in, uh, these companies will be required to disclose on climate. That means that their suppliers, small businesses, businesses in the global uh, south, will need to disclose, and we're worried that there will be unintended development consequences, a kind of stratification of developing economies as, uh, as an unintended consequence. So we're very excited about impact transparency. We can't get to impact accountability 
or impact equity until we have transparency. So it's incredibly important, but it's also important to keep an eye on the unintended consequences. And so, Ndidi, I was wondering how you think about scaling uh, the field and practice of impact investing, but doing so without perpetu further perpetuating systemic inequities. You know, a friend once said, instead of trying to scale our work, we should scale what works. <laughs> and that's the challenge we all face here. We all want to scale our individual organization's work instead of focusing on really being humble enough to know to scale what works. And one of the things that work around equity is investing in women. So gender lens investing is critical, right? It works. And sadly, yeah, I'm glad we have a lot of supporters in the audience. <laughs> so I'm preaching to the converted. But when you look at fund managers, on the continent of Africa, only 4%, in some countries, it's up to 10% goes to women fund managers. Uh, we're not seeing the funds flowing to these women who know how to invest in other women. We're not seeing deliberate efforts to hold fund managers, all fund managers accountable for how much of their funding goes to women-led organizations. And we're not tracking that data. So in addition to tracking some of the data that we think we should track on impact and ESG. I would like to advocate that we actively track about how much funding goes to gender and hold fund managers accountable to do better and to go deeper. Um, it works. Absolutely, and I know that uh, your fund is, is committed throughout to, to, to gender lens investing, so thank you for bringing up the, important, uh, the importance of gender. So to wrap, I'd like to do just a rapid fire round. Um, what are a couple of, like one or two words that you'd like to leave the audience with? A, around uh, you know, the importance of the growth of this movement, and B, as they start on their SOCAP journey, some things to keep in mind, but just little tidbits. Two words on my end. I would say, and uh, part of the discussion, scale, and the second one, opportunity. I mean, there is um, urgency sort of to scale, but there is also an opportunity out there to really connect, act as an ecosystem, mm -hmm. to build the field, and hopefully in Latin America, take it sort of to the next level and nice stream. Mm. Fantastic, thank you. And Didi? So in my language, the word love translates to Ahurum Ginaya, I see you in my eye. I see you. Mm. Um, I would like us to see each other uh, through SOCAP, but I also would like us to see each other beyond SOCAP. And that takes courage and it takes humility. But that's what the impact investing space needs today. Courage mm. and humility. Courage to ask tough questions, to challenge the status quo, to ensure that we create spaces for each other, and humility to learn and unlearn, and humility to scale not our work, but what works. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So my challenge to the audience builds on these co comments. Um, one is to be bold. The magnitude of the challenges at hand will require creativity, innovation, and radical partnership, and indeed cross-sectoral partner partnership um, and cross-jurisdictional partnership. And the other is to be intentional, because if we're not intentional, if we move around expediency, say, around climate investing, but we don't consider the communities that are most impacted and the constituencies that are most impacted, we will not be manifesting a more equitable, sustainable future. So thank you so much to my partners in discussion. Thank you, Santiago and Andidi, and thanks to you for being such a spunky audience. Um, wishing you a wonderful SOCAP, and uh, yeah, have a great rest of your day.